Father, righteous God, almighty Father, we are, we are grateful to just be in this room breathing, praising, praying, singing together. We thank you for watching over us and out for us for your care. And you know we struggle sometimes with your timing and with your answers. But our prayer is that we will never doubt your love and never doubt your wisdom and never doubt that you are in this for us. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for sending your spirit. Thank you for the, the son that you gave to save us for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we pray that all we do today will bring, will bring glory to you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, this morning, uh, welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. Uh, there's a card on the back of the seat in front of you. You can fill that out. You can indicate a prayer request on that. If you'd like to learn more about our church, you can indicate it as well on there. You can also go to twickenham.org and check out our website. We're just really glad that you're with us this morning. Thank you for being here. Before I came to the office this morning, I'd I drove down to the river. I live just about a half a mile from the river, so I just, I, I just wanted to drive down there. I pulled into the pavilion parking lot and just looked at, the, at, looked at the river to my left, and a little bit behind me, the sun was coming over the mountain, and I just, I was going to pray, but all I could say, all I could say was thank you, thank you, thank you. So I don't know where you're coming from today, okay? I don't know what kind of situation your life is in right now but you may be on the mountaintop things just may be awesome and thank you may come so easy for you or you may be in a deep valley right now wherever you are i know 
that God is on your side. In fact, that's, our, that's kind of the big thought for the day, that if God is for us, who can be against us? That, that since God is all in for us, we can be all in for each other and for others. If God is in it for you, you can be in it for others. And that's the confidence that I've got this morning. It is. We are not alone. We are not alone. Let's stand. Let's have a, another song here and continue to praise God. So glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Standing on this mountaintop, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, Yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you leave us on our own, you are faithful, God, you are faithful, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing Victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful. joy our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, carried by your constant grace, held within your perfect peace, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Every step we are breathing in your grace. Evermore we'll be breathing out your praise. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Mountaintop, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Would you join me in this reading from Romans 8? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God for me. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who did he give us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who then is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. For I am convinced 
that neither death nor life, neither the present nor the future, neither height nor depth, When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the light, you are the fight within my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over despair you are the whole. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible, every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts, you are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Would you be seated as we continue in Colossians as we prepare for communion this morning? For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. And so we offer thanks for that reconciliation. Let's pray for the bread. Father, we, we recognize and praise you for your great and awesome power. 
and also, Father, for your great and awesome love. And this bread that we're about to take represents both of those. We thank you for the great gift of Jesus' body that was sacrificed on the cross that represents your love for us and your great power over death. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bow me here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my
Your sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh. standing. I'm looking for something. Okay. Remember that part last week where I talked about needing patience for people you work with? You remember that part? 
Hey, a couple of program notes here. Um, next week, we're starting a new sermon series called Deeper. We're, we're, we're really going to talk about how to get out of the shallow end of the pool when it comes to our, com, comes to our, our commitment to Jesus. Uh, there's always a lot more going on on the deep end, and so we're gonna, that's what we're going to talk about for several weeks. There's a story in the Gospels about how, how Jesus told some fishermen to put out into the deep water, and that's a little bit scary sometimes, getting out into the deep. But man, that's where some really cool stuff begins to happen. So that's next week. You'll be praying about that. That would be a great thing if you've got a neighbor or a friend at work. It'd be a really good time to invite them to come and be with us. Here's another good thing you can do too. I think this is in our bulletin today, and there's some flyers in the back. Uh, There's an old college friend of mine named Owen Mitchell and his wife Lauren, who are going to be in Huntsville in a, a couple of weeks. Uh, they're with Family Dynamics Institute, and they're going to be holding a marriage seminar. Our, our gratitude to Madison Academy, their spiritual formation team, is sponsoring this and putting it together. But this is a, a great event for married couples. If you, uh, I, I, I'm not saying if you've got problems in your marriage, go to this. Yes, I'm just saying this would be good for anybody, any married couple to go to and, and be a part of this event. It's on August 26th and 27, Friday night, and then Saturday morning. Cost $30 a couple, but we think this is such a good thing, we'll pay for it. Okay, if you want to go, we'll pay for it. If you're a guest today, not a member here, and you want to go to this, we will pay for it. Just uh, let us know, and we'll make that happen for you. We just think it's a good thing to go to, a, a good thing to enrich our marriages. So when you give on Sunday mornings when the plate passes, that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to make possible, all right? So check out, pick out one of these folder, uh, folders in the back. You can go on our website, you can, uh, twickenham.org. You can also uh, give us a call at the office, and we'll tell you about it. Hey, at the end of our service, uh, I asked Glenn Laird if he would include a prayer for the folks in Louisiana. They are, you know, undergoing just more flooding. I think one area had 12 inches of rain last night. So uh, when Glenn comes up later on to, to do a prayer here at the end of the service, he's going he's gonna to remember all those folks in Louisiana, and I want you to be remembering them too through the week. We're blessed, folks. We are so blessed. Okay. Acts chapter 11 is where we're going to be this morning. Acts chapter 11, we're going to wrap up the gifted series. And I really appreciate the response you've made to this. A lot of folks have stepped up and said, I want to serve. Here's the thing that I can do, and we're plugging people in. So I really, I'm really grateful to God for the response you've given and the grace that's showing up in your life because of that. But we're going to wrap that series up this morning. Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Why don't you say that with me? Here we go. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. See here, you, we're not even halfway through the service, and you already learned something. Boom. Awesome. This is a great story. I love this story. Uh, it's a feel-good story, but it doesn't begin that way. Uh, but it's a little bit like a round-trip journey to a wonderful destination. You, you take off and land on the same runway. You complete the circle, and when the trip is over, you just feel really satisfied. And it's got some great lessons to teach us. So Acts chapter 11, and we're going to begin in verse 19. Okay, Acts chapter 11, we'll begin in verse 19. Here we go. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, we'll come back to that. I told you it didn't start out good. Those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. Verse 22 is a really cool verse. We're going to come back to that here in just a minute. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He wanted them to go deeper. 
He was a good man. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, these are the disciples in Antioch, the Christians, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, and that means they gave money. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So this odyssey begins in Jerusalem where a persecution breaks out against the church. Back in Acts chapter 7, uh, a leader in the church named Stephen was stoned to death. There was a rising star among the Jewish elite, and the, the, the Jewish elite are the ones who stoned Stephen. They didn't like what he said about the temple, so they killed him. And as they were killing him, there was this young man who was sort of a rising star among the Jewish elite named Saul. He witnessed the stoning, and he not only approved of it, but he aided and abetted the stoning of Stephen. In fact, it appears that, he was, that, that Saul was inspired by Stephen's death to initiate his own vendetta against the church, he, he, and, he, and he began traveling all over the place, far and wide, hunting down believers and throwing them in, in jail. Saul just became the bane of the church's existence. So because this persecution breaks out, the, the Christians in Jerusalem are forced to scatter. I mean, because they're, they're coming for you, so you, you got to get out of Dodge. And so they, they spread out in all directions, but as they went, they told the story. Now, at this point, almost all believers are Jews. There may be a handful of Gentiles, but for the most part, this is a Jewish, Jewish movement. The Christians are almost all Jews. And so naturally, wherever they go, they're blending in with other Jews, with their own countrymen, which makes sense, right? I mean, if you were forced to go live in a foreign country, say like California, right? You would, and you found people who drank sweet tea, ate grits, and believed in the SEC. That's who you'd hang out with, right? Those are the people you'd want to be with. So the Jews are, are going to these other towns, and they're hanging out with people a lot like that, which is human nature. But a few of those Jewish believers begin to tell the story to non-Jews, to Gentiles, to people like you and me. Thank God. That happened in the city of Antioch. Apparently, God was very pleased with this inclusivity, and so he blessed their efforts. And Luke says a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, verse 22, I told you we'd come back to that. I really love verse 22. This is such a cool verse. And all the, most of the English translations miss it. Not that I'm a Greek scholar, but it's, it's, in, the, it's in there. In the original language, literally, it reads like this. News of this, news of what was going on in Antioch, how God was blessing that, news of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. Isn't that kind of cool? It reached the ears of the church. The Jerusalem church didn't have a steeple, but it did have ears. That's because the church is not a building. It's a body. It has ears and feet and hands and mouths and eyes, all of which is a reminder that every one of us is an important part of the body. We are all gifted. We are all graced to work. We're a part of this body, and we have important things to do. So the Jerusalem leaders hear about what's happening in Antioch, and what do you think they did? They had a meeting, which is a part of the fallen nature of the church, right? Did you know that there will not be any meetings in heaven, which all by itself is enough motivation for you to go? But this was a productive meeting because they asked, apparently the question they ask is, who can we send to Antioch to help these, these young new believers grow? And the obvious answer was a man named Barnabas, whom they called Mr. Encouragement. That's exactly what his name meant, son of encouragement. 
every time Barnabas is mentioned in the Bible, every time something good happens. Earlier in Acts, when people are hungry, Barnabas sold a piece of land and gave the money to the church so that the apostles could use it to feed people. When, when a, an enemy of the church is converted and nobody wants to have anything to do with him, everybody's scared of him, nobody trusts him, Barnabas takes up for him. Barnabas speaks up for him. Barnabas actually becomes his champion. Wouldn't it be cool if every time somebody thought of you, somebody mentioned your name, people thought of something good you had done? That's, that's how it was with Barnabas. So he, he leaves Jerusalem. Barnabas leaves Jerusalem and goes to Antioch. And Luke says that when he arrived, he saw what God's grace was doing. He saw the evidence of God's grace. Apparently, if God's grace is flowing through your life, it shows more and more people are coming to the Lord through this encouraging ministry of Barnabas. In fact, so many people were coming to the Lord that, that Barnabas decided that the church in Antioch needed to add some staff. And so he goes about 75 miles, 50 to 75 miles up, up to Tarsus. And it just so happened there's a gifted teacher living up there who's a relatively new Christian, but Barnabas has a lot of faith in him, and his name was Saul who was the rising star among the Jewish elite who helped to stone Stephen. Saul was the young radical who initiated his own one-man jihad against the church. Saul is the man who started the persecution that scattered the disciples, who told the story that changed the lives that grew the church that Jesus built in Antioch. And now, he has come to Antioch to help the growing church grow some more. We call that ironic. It's instructive, too. Because what looks like a setback to us is often a set up for God. We look at life, maybe you don't, but I do. I kind of look at life like a baseball game, like a, like a Braves game. Three strikes and you're out. Three outs and you're on the bench, nine innings, and it's over. The, the great persecution that broke out in Jerusalem, huge setback, right? Strike one. Christians scattered all over the place, huge setback, strike two. Their numbers, their influence diluted, huge setback, strike three, the church is out. But all of those apparent setbacks were God's way of setting up a huge victory. The guy who tried to kill the church in one place winds up helping it grow in another. The racially exclusive, all Jews, all the time church becomes a racially inclusive, everybody's welcome anytime church. The settled in one town church becomes a mission-minded, story-spreading, band of roving evangelists church. Our setbacks are God's setups. You've been watching the, the Olympics? You watched volleyball? I watched the men's volleyball a couple of nights. Man, those guys would hurt you. I love volleyball. Volleyball is a fun game. A few years ago, I was chaperoning one of our youth trips in the church in Atlanta. Uh, we, we, we took a week long, we took our kids on a week long youth rally to a Christian college. And um, one afternoon during free time, a group of us decided to wander down to the gym where they had some, some volleyball. They had about four volleyball nets set up, and people were signing up and playing volleyball together and so we thought let's go do that and, and we really looked pretty good because we had two or three of the high school basketball players on our team and that was years ago so all of us were in all the, the adult guys were in really pretty good shape and so we went down and we signed up and we really felt good about our chances really felt confident especially when the first court to open up put us opposite a, a group of little ninth tenth and eleventh grade girls and they were so cute. They like cute little cheerleaders with their little ponytails up in colorful little scrunchies. And they had their cute little toenails painted. 
And when we asked them where they were from, they, they said they were from Mississippi, except that's not how they said it. They said, we're from Mississippi. And since it was really kind of sweet, and since we were bigger and stronger and good Christians, we let them have the first serve, which in retrospect <laughs> was a mistake because they didn't lose it. They scored point after point after point after point. People on other courts stopped and came over to watch. <laughs> we, and we tried everything. We did. I mean, we put our tallest guy, we, the basketball players, get on the net. And that didn't work. And then we, we put our best jumpers up front, and that didn't work. And we tried a 3-4-3 formation and a 4-3-3 and then a 3-3-4. And then we just put all 10 of us up on the net, you know. <laughs> and that didn't work. And after the match, we found out why none of that worked because those sweet little cheerleaders from Mississippi neglected to tell us that, that they were actually the defending Class 5A women's volleyball champions. <laughs> but that's not really why they won. They won because they knew the art of the setup. You see, on, on our team, and I use that term very loosely, every guy wanted to spike the ball every time. Every one of them, that's what we were there for. We wanted to, you know, <laughs> slam it down those little girls' throats. That's what we wanted to do. But on their team, the first, the first girl to the ball just popped it up. And then another little girl would slide under and she would pop it up. And then the third little girl would just kind of go over there and she would pop the ball over the net to where one of our players wasn't. <laughs> they, they won because every shot was a setup until the final shot. That's how God plays. Look, you may be in the middle of a really terrible crisis right now. When it feels like a massive setback in your life. It feels like the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to you. Maybe it's a, a marital struggle, or, or it's a health crisis, or it's a problem with one of your kids, or it's a problem with your parents. I, I'm not saying that what you're experiencing is not truly terrible. It, it is. It's keeping you up at night. It, it really does feel like the end of the world. I'm just saying that it may not be the end of the play. To God, this may be a set up for a more meaningful victory to follow. I can testify to you from personal experience that you can get to the end, you can get past the end, and God can still totally change the game. You're thinking strike out, strike out, strike out, and God's thinking set up, set up, set up. Our setbacks are God's setups. I hope that gives you some hope. Okay, so what happens when Paul arrives in Antioch? Well, Luke says that he and Barnabas worked there for a year and taught lots of people. It says the disciples are first called Christians in Antioch. Jerusalem continues to support that young work. Even, they even send some prophets down to, to the young church. And one of those prophets from Jerusalem is named Agabus. The Spirit led him to make a prediction. And verse 28 is important. Agabus says, through the, through the Spirit, that a severe famine was going to spread across the entire Roman world. That's important. A severe famine was going to spread across the entire Roman world. So the disciples in Antioch have a meeting themselves. And they decide to send some money to Jerusalem by Barnabas and Saul, which is an interesting response to the prediction that Agabus made. Because what does verse 28 say? A famine is going to affect the entire Roman world. Antioch is in the Roman world. They are, they are within that, that set. They're going to experience that famine too, but they take up a collection of money and send it to Jerusalem anyway. The, the church in the first century was just in it for other people. They were not in it for themselves. The church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch. You think Barnabas had a powerful ministry going in Jerusalem? Was he being effective in Jerusalem? He was effective everywhere he was, but 
the, the, the church in Jerusalem just said, you know what, Barnabas, you're doing a great work here, but we think you'd, you're, you're needed more in Antioch. And then Antioch said, yeah, the famine's going to hit us too, but we don't have any prophets to send Jerusalem. We don't, we don't have any leadership to send to Jerusalem, but we do have some money. So it'll be tough on us, but it'll be tougher on them. Let's send them some money. You got disciples who'd been scattered by a persecution who chose to proclaim the message rather than complain about their predicament. You got Saul who left Tarsus, his hometown, where he was known and respected and comfortable and came down south to Antioch to work with Gentiles. Everything everybody in this story does, they do for somebody else. It's almost like that's what being the church is all about. And the reason they were able to do that is because every person in this story believed that God was in it for them, that God was going to take care of them, that the future was in God's hands, that even though they faced a, set, a setback, they believed that was going to be a setup for God to do something awesome. And because they trusted that God was in it for them, they could be in it for others. When you know that God is in it for you, when you know that God is there for you, you can be there for other people. It is easy for us to settle into what Bill Hybels called a circle of conversational comfort. Surround ourselves with people who think what we think and believe what we believe and live like we live. It's easy to relate to them. It's effortless to engage. When a church eases into that circle of comfort, it just it stops living the, the mission of Christ. Instead of being missional, a lot of churches become mean instead of living for others they begin to look out for themselves rather than being a giving church they become griping churches when we slip into that circle of comfort we become more concerned about meeting the wants of the members than the needs of the masses when we slip into that comfort that circle of comfort we become more interested in getting our way than growing Rather than adjusting to new challenges, we get aggravated about change. We become more focused on holding the fort than becoming a force for change in the community. The bottom line is that a church that slips into that circle of comfort, away from being in, in it for others, is simply not a church anymore. We just kind of become a social club. Now, that's not who we are. That's not who they were. They were in it for others, and that's, and, and that's, that's not who we are. I, I don't want to be that, and I know you don't want to be that. I know that because a lot of us here are in it for Huntsville Inner City Learning Center. A lot of us go there every week. A lot of us here are in it for Lincoln Village. Those are two of our inner city, two inner city ministries here in town that we're concerned about. A lot of us are in it for Hacienda of Hope. We'll hear some about that next week. That's a... a, a an orphanage and a Christian school in Ecuador that we support. Some of us in this room are in it for His way, a recovery program, Christ-centered recovery program for men in town. Some of us are in it for others through PAR, Prepare and Respond, or Disaster Recovery Team. Others of us spend time trimming the hedges and mowing the lawns of, of people that can't do it for themselves through the mower ministry. A lot of us are doing stuff like that. Stepping out of our comfort zones into the unknown. That's where the adventure is. That's what we were made for. And we can do that because we know God is in it for us. We can be in it for other people. Hey, Dylan, can you come on up? Let me introduce you to somebody. Um, we got a call this week. One of our young members is uh, just got in from somewhere. Where'd you go? way out of town so you've been on a, a little bit of a mission trip you play volleyball <laughs> water polo <laughs> so dylan pollard is the son of, of uh dan and uh tracy and anna and dan and donna dan and donna are the grandparents and uh you just got back from new zealand Okay, so, and would you tell, tell, tell us why you went there. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the church family. 
There's so many people here who have supported me uh, to go on this trip, and it says a lot about your the servant's heart and um, just the, the, the people of God that y'all are, uh, just that y'all would um, invest into this trip and allow um, me to go on this trip to experience it for myself and uh, for people 13 hour flight away to, to experience God. What time did you get in uh, this morning? Um, I got in last night at uh, 1030. Okay. What time so, is it on your body right now? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely want to thank, you know, my family for supporting me and my beautiful girlfriend here. She, uh, she picked me up, drove seven hours from Georgia and uh, picked me up from the airport. So I'm very thankful for that. Good, good. So good. you were on a, it was like a basketball mission trip, right? So you're, you got this skill and you actually found a way to use that to serve God. Tell us about the trip itself. What was the purpose of that, of that particular trip? Yes, sir. So the organization is Athletes in Action. Um, there's a couple of pictures. So basically, this organization takes um, the sport that you love to do. Um, there's soccer, baseball, and so for me, it's basketball. And so um, it, it takes that, and you, you go overseas. First of all, you have a training camp. Our training camp was in Los Angeles, California. So I was there for five days training camp. You meet all guys from all over the country. And so basically, we just come together, and, um, and we train for, for five days, get to know the style coach coaches us run plays and stuff and then we we fly to New Zealand um, flew 13 hours uh, there and, and ended up there so um, basically it just uses basketball as a platform to reach others and, and reach others uh, through through common interest and so similar you know we're, we're all gifted uh, with with talents and gifts so um, that's that's what this basically organization is about so you're, you're playing basketball in New Zealand with other other Christians Tell us what, where did you see God working in, in, that, in that event? How does God work Man. through basketball? Um, it was so many ways, even on our own team. Um, we had one guy who was, who was not even a believer. Um, his name's Buna from, from Norway. Um, and, and God just brought him on the trip, and um, God just really worked on him. He said at the beginning of the trip, uh, he, like, coach did a football analogy on the other end of the end zone, and Buna literally went from the other end of the end zone touchdown, whatever you want to say. So that's, but seriously, I mean, it, God really brought him from the other end of the field all the way um, to, to giving his life on the, to Christ on the trip. So that was just with our own team. Um, and, you know, um, God just really used it um, to, to reach others. And, and we had opportunities after the basketball games, um, fans or, or people would come up and just, you know, we, we actually, I'm sorry, we would share a testimony at halftime. And uh, one of the players would go and share his testimony at halftime of the game. Um, and so, you know, we would, we would tell people, hey, you know, come out, uh, come after the game, and, and we, we would love to, to tell you our story or other players or, or you know, just, just come, come and, and speak to us afterwards. So there were several that would come up and just, just awesome. People, you just, you just hear their story and they would tell you theirs. And, I, you know, we had, we had several follow-up opportunities to be able to talk to people and meet with them um, afterwards. Um, so... You know, several people who just, New Zealand is a very, they're comfortable. They're, they're just, they're, they're happy, and they're the, the most chill people I've ever met in my life. They're just relaxed. They're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. But uh, literally 5% of the population is, is Christian or, or knows of Christianity. And so very small. And, and you know, this is only in New Zealand. So um, it was just incredible just to, to share Jesus with people who have never even heard about him. You know, and have that opportunity was just a, a complete blessing. And, um, you know, there was, there was, you know, I didn't, there was none that, that, like, came to Christ through my conversation, but I was able to plant that seed. And that's, you know, God's, you plant the seed and God waters it. And that's, I mean, that's just, just, just such a blessing just to, to be able to share my faith with people who have no idea who they are. And, Awesome. Dylan, welcome back. We're proud of you. We love you. Thank you for going out and coming back safely. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. So it's a, a great story there, a great testimony about how basketball, right? And there, you can take that ability, that gift, and use that to glorify God. And you and I can do that kind of thing with whatever we've been given. Because we know that God 
is on our side and God is with us and God is for us and since he is in it for us we can be totally in it for others I don't have to focus on my worries I don't have to focus on my needs and concerns I know God's gonna take care of me I know that my God reigns and so those of us who are redeemed can go out and tell that story of what he has done in our lives listen this week you're gonna have an opportunity to do exactly that to just be God be God's messenger in a, in a spot in your work in your neighborhood in your home let me just encourage you God is in it for you you can relax you can be in it for others because of that let's stand up and let's sing this song here together let the earth and heavens rejoice for the Lord our God reigns every child of God lift your voice for the Lord our God reigns Jesus Emmanuel he has set us free hopeless souls redeemed to tell for the Lord our God reigns for the Lord our God reigns every heart be filled with his light for the Lord our God reigns all the hopeless dance with delight for the Lord our God reigns Jesus Emmanuel he has set us free hopeless souls redeemed to tell for the Lord our God reigns for the Lord our God reigns Jesus Emmanuel he has set us free hopeless souls redeemed to tell for the Lord our God reigns for the Lord our God reigns for the Lord for the Lord for the Lord our God reigns hey thanks for being here this morning we really do appreciate it just uh, two things as we close. Tonight at 5 o'clock is the spring, our instrumental praise and worship time. And all of the guys from His Way that Jody mentioned earlier will be here to join us in that worship time. And Tom Reynolds will be sharing some thoughts. So come back and join us at 5. It'll be a great time, I think, together tonight as we worship. Secondly, Mark Chastain. Mark and Larissa. Uh, Mark's father passed away yesterday in Florence. We don't have any of the details yet. Uh, but we'll get those out as soon as we can. So please keep... Uh, the family, Ethan, and the girls, and Mark, and the reaching your prayers uh, today and in the coming days. Again, thanks for being here. Let's close with prayer, Glenn. Bow with me. Father Jody started out this morning by telling us the story and just going down to the river and looking at the sun rise and uh, just having on his heart just nothing but gratitude. I know, Father, a lot of us this week saw rainbows in the sky. Wednesday saw one, Wednesday evening one that was just different hues of red. And Father, it was just so amazing to think about your covenant promise that you've made to us. There's so many promises, Father, that you've made and that you're, you're good, Father. You're gracious. You keep your promises and we're grateful. And yet, Father, when there's flooding in our world, we sometimes, we sometimes wonder and I know that the, it's, it's testing a, a lot of people, but Father, you never promised that we wouldn't have trials. And Father, I, I, I would pray this morning that, that you just bring out the sun and let the, the sun shine, but Father, I don't know what you're setting up. And so Father, I just pray that, that you're setting up something that you'll be glorified. That, that Christians uh, who are affected by the flooding will be able to show a difference that you make in their lives. I pray, Father, that those who, who don't believe will see that they have a need for something that is much greater than themselves. But Father, again, I just pray for comfort for the folks that are affected by the flood, but I pray, Father, that it comes in a way that glorifies you. Father, I pray for the Chastain family as they're dealing with the grief this morning, and I just pray, Father, a special blessing on them. Father, we've come here today to have our tanks filled, and that's happened. Help us, Father, to leave this place ready to live for you and to show people that you really do make a difference in our lives. These things we lift up through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our, our Redeemer. Amen.